Johnny Dollar. Pat McCracken, Johnny. Universal adjustment. Sorry, Pat, but the answer is no. Huh? My bags and fishing tackle are all packed. Johnny. My plane ticket is just waiting for me out of Bradley Field. Plane's due to take off in a few minutes, and believe me, I'm going to be on board. Well, fine. So don't try to stop me. Well, because what I called you about... <laughs> well, listen, Johnny. It's no use, Pat. I'll see you when I get back, and not until. That's what you think. Well, now, look, there's nothing so important that it can't wait a week or so. Wrong, Johnny. Now, listen. No, no, I'm sorry, but it's no use. But don't you see... Johnny. All I see is that it's time for me to get out there to the airport. I'll drive you out. Oh, no, you won't. Johnny, will you listen to me? So long, Pat. Johnny. <laughs> and so help me if he tries chasing me out to the airport. CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Yeah, to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the wholly unexpected matter. Well, it looked as though even my taxi out to Bradley Field was conspiring against me. It developed a flat tire along the way that almost made me miss the plane. Oh, and that cab and plane fare, item one on the expense account, $163 even. Though I didn't realize that at the time it was going to be paid for by Universal Adjustment Bureau. Anyhow, I got to the field in the nick of time, jumped aboard the ferry plane for New York. Just sit right here by the door, please, Mr. Dollar, okay. until we get airborne. Oh, and be sure to fasten your seatbelt, please. Yeah, sure, miss. Yeah. There. I thought for a minute we'd have to take off without you. Oh, not a chance. I wouldn't have missed this plane if I'd had to fly after it under my own power. Johnny Dollar. You're the famous private investigator, aren't you? Yeah, I'm an insurance investigator. Oh, I listen to every one of the exciting cases you handle every Sunday on CBS. Do you? Good. Only, believe me, they're not as exciting as they sound. I don't believe that. No, it's just like any other job of work. And as for that wild expense account of yours, thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, 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 I... Uh, uh, that's a very touchy subject, Miss... Uh... Uh, Claire, my name's Claire. I mean, after all, Claire, a man has to wangle some kind of compensation on a job like mine. You mean because it's so risky and all, and I don't blame you a bit. Are you off on some dangerous investigation now, Mr. Mm, Dollar? No, siree. No, ma'am. I'm heading for a place over in western Arizona, Lake Mojave Resort on the Colorado River. <laughs> I know. The place you're always going to fish. Uh, well, the place where I always try to get in some fishing. <laughs> That's right. Something always happens and spoils your plans. Yeah, but not this time. You see, I do listen to your program. But now we're airborne, Mr. Dollar, so you can get rid of the seatbelt and go up to seat 11 that I saved for you. Oh, yeah, sure. Thanks a lot, Claire. Pleasure, Johnny, and I hope you have a wonderful trip. Oh, believe me, nothing, nothing's going to stop me this time. For once in my life, I'm going to... I'm going to... Oh, no. Yeah, I arranged for the seating myself, Johnny. Pat McCracken. That's right. Sit down. Stewardess! Claire! Oh, Johnny. Help! Are you oh, listen to me, Pat. Come on, sit down and make yourself easy. What is easy. it, Mr. Dollar? What's wrong? Give me another seat on this crate. Oh, now, Johnny. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but this is the only one left, and Mr. McCracken insisted that I save it for oh, you. Oh, he did, did he? You wouldn't want to stand all the way down to New York. Besides, the airline wouldn't like it. Now, Pat... Okay. Okay. But only as far as New York. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> if I were you, I wouldn't be too sure. Yeah? All right, now, you listen. The minute we land in New York, where I can pick up another plane, Pat... You and I part company. You want to bet on that? It's an interesting fact that many of our greatest inventions and discoveries have been hit upon accidentally by doctors, engineers, or inspired tinkerers while working toward some other objective. Thomas Edison had such an accident. While working on an advanced telegraph instrument, he noticed a faint musical sound coming from the revolving paper-covered cylinder he was using. He noticed that indentations in the paper 
caused the needle to vibrate, and the vibrations produced the sound. Setting aside the telegraph instrument momentarily, he experimented with the principle he had accidentally discovered. He fixed a needle to a diaphragm mounted on the short end of a horn and arranged this apparatus so that the needle would scrape on the revolving cylinder as it turned. Instead of paper on the cylinder, he used a covering of tinfoil and then spoke through the horn as the cylinder turned and the vibrations of his voice caused the needle to make indentations of varying depths in the tinfoil surface. After a few models had been made and tested with minor success, Edison recited into the horn the nursery rhyme, Mary had a little lamb. Then it was played back, and for the first time in history, a machine spoke with a man's voice. Thus the phonograph was born, an invention that grew out of an ingenious inventor's attempt to produce something else. The phonograph and all its various advancements and refinements up to today's tape recording have brought endless pleasure to millions throughout the world. More importantly, they have been used for the advancement of science and culture to an incredible degree. This is just one of many cases in which the illustrious Thomas A. Edison succeeded in his efforts by following the American inventor's traditional philosophy, there must be a way. Let's find it. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the wholly unexpected matter. When we got off for New York, I said so long and goodbye to Pat McCracken, then climbed aboard one of the big jets. But just before takeoff, who should come barging in and take the seat next to me? Well, of course, Johnny. This is the seat that was assigned to me. All right, all right, all right now, Pat. How did you know what flight I was taking out of Hartford? Which one out of New York? Easy, Johnny, easy. I simply checked with the airline back there at Bradley Field. Ish. Now, instead of clamming up the way you did on the trip from Hartford to New York, let's talk about this. I'm sorry, Pat, but I'm on a vacation, and this is one time. Neither you nor anybody else is going to keep me from going out to... Yes? Uh, well, I just... Go ahead and say it, Johnny, to Lake Mojave Resort out along the Colorado. Huh? How did... I mean... <laughs> oh, what makes you think that? Well, where else in the world would you go to get away from it all for a few days? Well, I... lots of places. I... Not Maybe... this time. How do you know? I'm just betting on it. That's why I dragged along all my fishing tackle. Fishing? Huh? Sure. After hearing you rave about the place all these years, <laughs> I decided it was high time I took a crack now, at it, now, too. Now, wait a minute. Just a yes, minute. Yes, Johnny. You mean that when you call me back at my apartment, it, yeah. it, it wasn't about some kind of an assignment? The farthest thing from my mind. Oh, yeah? Honor bright. What? Then why didn't you say so? So who had a chance? Well, do we go fishing together or don't we? All right, just one condition, Pat. Yeah. Not one single word of business until we get back to Hartford. Who said anything about business? Don't you think I need a vacation now and then as much as you do? Okay, then, okay. Now, that's, that's settled. That's settled, yeah. Now, make with some talk about those nice big fish that we're going to... Okay, I'll... T huh? What's the matter? What? Nothing, nothing. I've been looking at that fellow sitting up there in the seat next to the emergency exit. Oh, what about him? Mm, nothing, really. It's just that he uh, looks very familiar. And yeah. what's more, I'm sure he was also aboard the plane out of Hartford. Oh, so were several other people. Remember, the plane was full. Yes, and I tried to tell you about the way he kept looking back at you in a, in a funny sort of Oh, no, now way. quit it, Pat. Just well, quit Well, it's a fact, John. Oh, look, did you see that? He gave us a quick glance and then buried his face in his magazine. Again. So what? Well, almost as though he didn't want to be seen by us. Now, you look here, well, Are Pat. you sure that you don't recognize him? That face is mighty familiar. Well, it isn't to me. So forget it and relax and let's enjoy ourselves. That funny little scar on his cheek when he half turned just... Johnny, are you sure you didn't... Now, I said forget it. Okay, whatever you say. At Los Angeles, we grabbed another ferry plane, this one to Las Vegas, Nevada. Johnny, look, that same man aboard, and don't tell me so what. It was late when we arrived at the fabulous city of chance out there in the middle of the Mojave Desert. So we grabbed a cab into the Hotel Sahara, that's item two, a buck and a quarter. Item three is $16 for a suite of rooms. Item four is $12.20 for a couple of drinks and a good meal. Then we dropped into the casino. 
Oh, real excitement. Yeah, watching the little ivory ball click around the roulette wheel, the snap of cards at the blackjack table, the rattle of dice, the click of poker chips, the ring of silver dollars, and over it all, the constant chuck and whir of the slot machines. Pat and I had separated, and by some stroke of good luck, I did all right with the dice. So I hauled my stack of chips over to the cashier's cage and collected, believe it or not, 200, 300, 350, 60, 365 dollars. Right on the nose. Thanks. Thanks very much. Yes, sir. Next, please. Oh, Johnny. Johnny, there you are. Yeah, I sure am. Well, how you doing, Pat? All right, fine. Now, listen. Yeah? That man we saw on the plane... That you saw. Well, I saw him again a little while ago while you were at the roulette so table. So He was watching you, and when he saw me watching him... He... Oh, he... now, Pat, would Johnny, you... Johnny, we... Probably, look, half a dozen people from Hartford have taken this same set of planes out here. After all, it's vacation time, well, a lot of people. okay, Johnny, I, I hope you're right. Oh, sure I'm right. Now, look, let's get some sleep, and first thing in the morning, we'll head down to the lake, huh? Come on. Well, whatever you say, only... Only stop worrying, will you? Will you? Sure, Johnny, sure. Any American accused of a serious crime has the right to a jury trial. But you also have the right to have your case decided by a jury in most civil cases when you are suing in the federal courts for damages or for the recovery of your property. Do you know when you can exercise this right? The answer is in the Constitution. The Seventh Amendment says that you can have your case decided by a jury whenever the amount involved is greater than $20. This is one of the ways in which the Constitution seeks to provide every citizen with fair and impartial justice. It is one of the ways in which the Constitution ensures that this country of yours and mine shall be our country under God. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Well, it wasn't much after the crack of dawn that Pat McCracken and I rented a car. That's item five on the expense account, 50 bucks deposit. And then we headed south. Five miles short of Kingman, Arizona, we swung right on 68 down toward Davis Dam, down to Lake Mojave Resort. Once over the mountain pass, there were miles and miles of nothing but sun-baked rock and sand, of sagebrush and Joshua trees, of tumbleweed and cactus. And then, well, right in the middle of it, that clear blue water of Lake Mojave. The resort itself, with everything for water sports and, more important for me, for the fishermen. Buster Favor signed us in at the office, and then... Okay, you're in number eight, Johnny. And if you and Mr. McCracken don't get limits every day... Mr. McCracken? Oh, out here, Buster, it's Pat. Okay, Pat. Wow, shall we? Oh, incidentally, you're not the only one that's out here from Hartford. Oh, that right, Buster? Uh, Mr. Malloy arrived late last night. Malloy. Does that name ring a bell, Johnny? It certainly does not. Now, will you forget about that man you saw? Excuse me. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, you ought to be. Okay. Now let's unpack and yeah, go fishing. Oh, brother, yeah, just is. try and stop me. Just, just right. forget all about business. Well, we... Excuse me, excuse me, Pat. What? This calls for you. Oh, oh, thanks. You mean you told somebody where you were coming? Only my office, Johnny, you know. Idiot. Here you are. Thank you. Hello. Mr. McCracken, this is Marion at the office. Now, Marion, I said the only calls I want out Please, here... Please, Mr. McCracken, is Johnny Dollar with you? You know he is. Why? That arson case you assigned him three years ago, the Morley Warehouse. The Morley Warehouse fire? What? What's that? Get this, Johnny. Yeah. What about it, Marion? Well, it was Mr. Dollar who told the police how to catch Danny Maloney for that job. Yes, that's right. Scarface Maloney. Now, when they but they put Maloney in state prison for it, he swore that if he ever got out... Well, he's out. Maloney, Maloney. Did you hear me, Mr. McCracken? Scarface Maloney has escaped from the state prison over at Weathersfield night before last. Yeah. And if he carries out his threat against yeah. Johnny Dollar... You hear that, Johnny? Yeah, I heard. The man aboard the plane with a scar on his cheek? And you wouldn't bother looking at him. All right, now. Okay, now Johnny, time. you're on the expense account. Hey, what's this all about? Um, Buster, the man from Hartford. Uh, Maloney, is not Has he got a scar on his face, Buster? Why, yeah, on his cheek. Where is he? And come to think of it, Johnny, he asked when you'd be arriving. Where is he? Oh, he went out fishing early this morning. You know where, Buster? Just up the lake somewhere is all I know. All right, now. Did you tell him when I'd arrive? No, wasn't sure myself. Then we're one up on him. Maybe. Mr. Malloy looks like a mighty fine man to me. Don't be fooled, Buster. Johnny, what'll we do? Buster, you're the best judge of character I've ever known. Thanks, Johnny. Well, Johnny... 
Pat, you and I are going fishing. What? I know Lake Mojave well. Scarface Maloney, he couldn't possibly know much about it. So Pat and I put on fishing clothes, took along our tackle, I took along a gun, and we headed up the lake in a fast outboard. We prowled into every wash and cove at the lower end of the lake, slowly and methodically. We saw lots of fishermen, but not the man we were looking for. Finally, well, I, I guess the spell of Lake Mojave was just too much for me, so I hove to at the end of a long, narrow cove with high walls of rock on every side. Hey, why stop here, Johnny? Well, I am one cast cove, Pat. What? Oh, look, it's just too good to pass up. Now, you drop a plug there in the corner. Just one cast, oh. and I guarantee you a bass. You think of fishing at a time like this? Oh, come on now. Just try it, Pat. Then then we'll go back to the main body of the Wait lake, and we'll find no, the... No. Johnny, look. Huh? Huh? No, no, careful, so he won't see you. Up on that rock that overhangs the end of the cove. Yeah. Yeah, I see him. Hiding behind a boulder. Yeah. <clears throat> Look. I see it, I see it. At least the glint of the sun. Blued steel, Johnny. Yeah. I can't see what it is, but I don't need to, Johnny, because it's aimed this way. Of all the heavenly bodies, the moon has gained such importance that it's continually in today's news. Now, to land a rocket ship on the moon, you must know the moon's exact orbit and rate of speed around the Earth. For decades, scientists were sure they knew these facts. But one man felt they were wrong and proved it. Simon Newcomb was born in 1835 in Wallace, Nova Scotia. Throughout his childhood, he amazed his elders with his uncanny perception of mathematics. While in his teens, Newcomb joined his father, who was teaching in the United States. In 1854, they finally settled in Maryland, where Newcomb also became a teacher. One day on a trip to Washington, he visited the Smithsonian Institute. From then on, he spent every free moment studying from its wonderful wealth of books. Reading book after book, he stumbled onto four volumes which kindled his enthusiasm into a brilliant flame. The books told of the amazing world of astronomy. Early in his new career, he became especially interested in the moon. He studied it intensely. One evening, he noticed that it seemed to be lagging a little behind its predicted schedule of motion. Surrounding himself with tables and charts, he painstakingly pursued the possible error. After exhaustive effort, he found it. An error in computation had been made back in the year 1675. If Newcomb had not discovered this error, a flight to the moon might never have been possible. Simon Newcomb. Another American scientist, dedicated to the principle that somehow there must be a way. Let's find it. Now, here's act four of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The end of a long cove surrounded by high walls of rock, and on top, a man with blued steel in his hand, aimed straight down at us. Johnny, with the sun in our faces, he's got the advantage of us. We're like sitting ducks down here. What do we do? Now listen, Pat. Yeah? I don't like it, but it's the only way. If I rock us forward a bit, like this, yeah. it'll put my end of the boat behind the ledge. Yeah. I'll tie up to it, out of his sight. You'll be the sitting duck. So what? It's you he's after. Well, you'll be in plain sight of him, so go ahead and fish. If you get something, and I'm sure you will, make like you're talking to me, like I'm still here, huh? And you? Through that crevice. Do you see it there? Yeah. Maybe. Just maybe I can get around and up behind it. Oh, Johnny, that gun It's our only chance, Pat. Now, look. I can tie us up now. With only you inside of me. Okay, Johnny. All right, start fishing. And believe me, brother, good luck. Right. One cast coal, huh? Well, Johnny, we'll just see about that. Right there in the corner, huh? You mean like this? <laughs> Carefully, Holy smoke, slowly, right. He's I edged my way up the long crevice in the rocks so toward the man who'd been spying on us from above. I was afraid that every step would loosen a slide of rocks and warn him. But all of his attention was on the boat in the cove below where Pat, bless his heart, was dragging out his fight with a fish. The man's back was to me, and then... Oh, wait a minute. Blued steel? Sure it was. Yeah. An old pair of binoculars. Then I slipped on the small rock. Oh, why, Mr. Dollar? Yeah, that's right. Who are you? Malloy's the name, Mr. Dollar. Franklin J. Mal... Why, that gun. That's right. 
Why, good heavens, I, I didn't realize you were this jealous of your fishing secrets. Now, what's that supposed to mean? Malloy, Maloney, whatever your name is? Please put it down, sir. Brother, you start talking. Well, you see, it's just that I've heard so much about your fishing over here over the years. Oh, yeah? And uh -huh. when my lady friend who works for the airline back there in Hartford... Your lady friend? Uh, well, why? well, when she told me you were coming out here again, I thought maybe if I... If I kind of spied on you, well, maybe I could learn to catch some of the nice big fish out here the way you do. Now, Mr. Malloy... But I didn't think you'd go so far as to use a gun Johnny. to... to protect. Hey, Johnny! Yeah, I'm here, Buster. Oh, yeah. Well, I just thought you and Pat here ought to know about another phone call just came in. Yeah? Those Hartford police of yours must be pretty good. What's that mean? They picked up that Scarface Maloney about an hour ago, and he's back in the pen. Johnny! Oh, and I see you found Mr. Malloy. Buster, please, Mr. Dollar. I'll get to you in a minute. Hey, Buster, you, uh, you take Pat out where he can catch some little bluegill or a uh, tired old carp, maybe. Eh? Mr. Malloy and I are going after some real lunkers. A couple of secret spots I know. What's your? Okay, Mr. Malloy. Bless you, Mr. Dollar. Well, you sure can't win them all. Especially when there isn't anything to win. And at long last, I got in a full week of fishing at Lake Mojave. Expense account total? Well, Pat, you add it up. After all, you're paying for it. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Shirley Mitchell, Larry Dobkin, Sam Edwards, Barney Phillips, and Edgar Barrier. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is John Wall speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.